Hey, good morning everybody. Matt Zerby here from Wasco Nursery and uh, welcome to another uh, Saturday morning edition of Coffee with Matt. We are glad you're here. Hopefully you've got a nice cup of coffee or tea and uh, you're ready to start this weekend. Uh, we Looks like we just have an absolutely gorgeous weekend on tap. Uh, nice and warm, lots of sun. Uh, should be a great weekend for doing just about anything outside. So that will be nice. Um, before we get started, I want to make just a quick uh, little plug for uh, an event that we have coming up uh, in person on uh, June 20th, which is Father's Day. Um, we're trying to take the guesswork out of what you, uh, what you can do for your dad uh, or the father in your life. So uh, we have a food truck festival happening here at Wasco. So uh, in the parking lot, we're going to have a handful of food trucks. Uh, uh, Burger Buzz is going to be here, Open Door Coffee, Pierogi Joe's, and uh, Fire and Smoke. Uh, barbecue company are going to be here so uh, you know bring dad by bring the family by T you don't have to worry about cooking or cleaning or anything else so um, it should be kind of a fun event that goes from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. Uh, so set up for lunchtime um, bring the family by and you can uh, hang out here for a bit you can walk around the grounds you can check out the plants and uh, and have some good food so that's June 20th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, so today's topic is uh, roses. Um, I picked today for roses because uh, one, the hot weather is just starting and roses are really just coming into their own uh, when the warm weather starts. Um, but it's also National Rose Month. So I thought it would be fitting to do that uh, here on the first Saturday in June. Uh, so we have a lot to talk about. I've got uh, a bunch of different samples of roses up here. We'll talk about some of the different varieties. Um, before we jump into the varieties, I wanted to talk a little bit about care and pruning and things like that. So we'll start there and then I'll talk to you about some of my favorite varieties. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll get started here. So first I wanted to mention um, a couple of uh, rose disease problems or rose treatments. So uh, roses are a little more finicky than some other plants, although we're going to look at some varieties that are very... Uh, very tolerant of just about everything. So they're, they're not disease prone, they're not insect prone. Um, they can be pretty much let go and left alone. But I do have a lot of folks who ask me questions about caring for some of the old fashioned roses or uh, some of the, uh, the fancier like English roses, things like that, how to care for them, that type of thing. So we're gonna look at a little bit of those. Um, First off, I've, uh, every year I get a handful of people asking me about uh, or bringing in samples. Maybe they don't even know what it is. Um, but there's two viral uh, virus issues that uh, can happen on roses. One is called rose mosaic virus. And um, that is characterized by a little yellow kind of zigzaggy line uh, on the leaves. The leaves will start to turn yellow, kind of get some weird mottled yellow and green discoloration. Um, uh, rose mosaic virus is delivered to the plant via aphids. So aphids are tiny little uh, uh, insects with a sucking mouth part. So they uh, insert their mouth part into the stem or leaf. They're pulling juices out, but just like you or I would get uh, a reaction if we get uh, bit by a mosquito, um, the plant's reaction to that sometimes um, in that whole process is it picks up this virus. Um, so. Unfortunately, that's the way it's delivered. There is no known cure for rose mosaic virus. So generally when you do see rose mosaic virus in a group of plants, it's best just to remove that one plant and uh, move on from there. If you have it throughout the whole bed, you'd wanna get rid of them all together. Um, you can uh, treat and spray for aphid issues on roses. Um, however, generally speaking, uh, the insecticides don't work uh, fast enough because once the insect bites down on the plant, uh, maybe gets a dose of the insecticide that you sprayed, uh, it's already delivered the rose mosaic virus if it, if it had it. So um, that's not really going to work, but keeping the uh, plants disease and insect free certainly will help. Um, the other viral issue that I'm seeing, um, not a lot of by any means, but uh, a little bit here and there, is something called rose rosette disease. Rose rosette disease is kind of wild. Um, you will notice first that you get a lot of bright red new growth. So red new growth is very common on roses, but um, a whole big like flurry of new growth with bright red color. 
One of the other characteristics is, um, you know, I'm looking at this rose here and there's, I would say, uh, you know, like in this section down here, there's, oh, just a handful of thorns on the branch, you know, maybe one, two, three, they kind of alternate. So in a distance of say three or four inches, there's maybe six or seven thorns. But with rose rosette disease, you will see uh, the new growth with just literally dozens of thorns per inch or two of stem length. So lots and lots of thorns, uh, bright red new growth, uh, weird distorted new growth, that's rose rosette disease. Um, rose rosette disease is uh, also a virus. There is also no known cure for rose rosette. Um, so again, best to uh, just remove the plant. Uh, rose rosette is uh, delivered via uh, a mite. So not the aphids that are delivering rose mosaic virus, it's from a little mite, uh, which are very hard to see. Um, it's not super common, but we do see it from time to time. And um, so it's best just to, again, cut your losses, dig that one out, get rid of it, put a new one in, kind of start over, and um, hopefully it doesn't uh, spread to the other ones. Um, so that's rose rosette disease. So those are two that are really difficult to control. Um, now, more often, because we have a very um, humid, typically humid uh, weather here in, in the northern Illinois area, uh, we tend to see a lot of uh, what's called black spot and or uh, powdery mildew on roses. Um, so uh, when, you have, when you have black spot disease, oftentimes it's just from the weather, the humidity, things like that. But it's also oftentimes because people are watering overhead. Um, so if you're watering with a watering wand and you're getting the foliage wet or you have an irrigation system, a sprinkler system that's going and it's getting the foliage wet, uh, you are for sure contributing to the problem of black spot disease. So black spot disease are yellow leaves with typically little black spots on the leaf. Um, oftentimes it's more towards the interior of the plant because there's less air circulation and those leaves will stay wet longer. Uh, out on the perimeter of the plant where, you know, just like today, there's a little breeze blowing, these leaves would dry out faster, but on the inside of the plant, it's going to be, uh, the leaf surface will be wet for a little longer. Uh, so what can you do for black spot disease? You can do a couple of things. One, try to change your irrigation system so you're no longer getting the foliage wet. Maybe go to a drip system where it's just watering right at the ground level rather than up on the foliage. If you're watering by hand with like a watering wand or spray wand of some kind, turn it upside down so that the wand is, you know, kind of like a hockey stick and water right at the base of the plant right near the root system rather than getting the foliage wet. So those are two ways. Um, there are some uh, really good products that will help uh, with black spot disease. I've got a couple of them right here. So if you have um, just a couple of roses, you could use something like this. This is called Rose RX 3-in-1. It's actually a uh, fungicide, which will help prevent the black spot disease. It's also an insecticide and miticide. So this will work really well. Obviously, it's just a little spray bottle. So you're going to spray the foliage, uh, get it all good and wet, and then uh, let it dry. So that will work well if you just have a couple of plants. Um, if you have more plants, you may want to consider these because, uh, you know, doing the little trigger uh, sprayer like this can get very tedious and tiresome on your hand. Um, so both of these are concentrate products. This one here is called Rose RX Systemic Drench. So this, this is a one quart bottle. It'll treat 16 roses. So it actually, um, or four roses four times or any of that kind of thing. So um, it actually goes a long way. You, it's really easy to use. You just mix it with water with a, a gallon, I believe, of water in a watering can or bucket and just pour it right at the base of the tree or base of the shrub, rather. This will uh, control uh, both insect and disease and it'll last for around six-ish weeks. So it'll prevent black spot disease. It, it helps uh, prevent and control powdery mildew, um, which is like a little white, almost fuzzy substance that you'll see on the foliage sometimes. Um, so that'll, it'll treat that. It'll also control for uh, Japanese beetles, which uh, are a, uh, can be a, an issue on some roses. So um, that will work really well. It's uh, nice and easy to use because you don't really have to do a whole lot of uh, um, spraying or anything like that. It's just bucket or water and can real easy. And then lastly, this is a really great product. So serious rose growers really like this. This is called Rose Shield. 
It's a concentrate. You mix this with water and a pump sprayer and you spray it on the foliage. Um, it, it is systemic. It'll get absorbed into the plant. It works really well. It'll control both disease and insect. And um, it's rainproof in an hour. It lasts for several weeks. So this is a really good uh, product for serious rose growers. Um, or especially if you have some of the more disease prone or a little more uh, uh, touchy or finicky plants, that, that'll be a really good product for you. So um, if you're just dealing with fungal issues like black spot and powdery mildew, you can also use any uh, general fungicide. So Infuse is one that's common that we sell for a lot of other reasons, apple scab and uh, powdery mildew on other plants. So you could use Infuse if you already have that in the garage. You could use a copper fungicide or something like daconil or funganil. Any of those are going to work against black spot and powdery mildew. Um, but being a fungicide only, it's only going to control the fungal issues it is not going to control any of the insect issues that you might have. So um, hopefully that helps a little bit. Didn't want to spend a lot of time on chemicals and that kind of thing, but, uh, but it, is, uh, it is necessary when talking about roses. So um, the next thing that I want to talk about uh, before we start talking about all the different uh, varieties of roses is about uh, trimming. So I'm going to take this one, this one here and kind of turn it a bit so you can kind of see here. So um, I get a lot of questions about trimming roses, how to trim them, when to trim them, um, and we're going to talk about both of those things. So first, uh, in terms of timing, um, I'm not sure where this came from, but a lot of landscapers and uh, just homeowners uh, decided a long while back that, that they should cut their roses down prior to winter. Um, so in the late fall, they would trim the roses back you know, maybe cutting them back to 16 or 18 inches or something like that. Um, I actually don't like that practice at all. Um, I've mentioned this in some other talks about pruning. Um, I believe I mentioned it when we talked about perennial hibiscus. Um, but one thing that happens when you trim a rose in the fall is you expose the center of the stem and allow it to dry out much, much faster and allow that cold to go deeper down into the plant and root system. So. Um, one of the primary reasons that you have uh, stem death in the winter time is from what's called desiccation. Desiccation is just a fancy word that means it dried out. It got like completely dried out, no moisture left whatsoever. So it's called desiccation. And when you cut, um, when you cut a uh, a stem, you're going to keep that. You're you're breaking the seal, just like on our skin or anything else. You're breaking the seal and then you're allowing that to dry out much, much faster. So I don't like to do any trimming of roses in the fall, basically at all. Um, I wait until springtime. I wait until actually like late March or really even mid April. And I start to look for that healthy red or green new growth and where that's coming from. At that time, I'm going to take and trim off any uh, stems that are say, um, you know, an eighth inch or quarter inch in diameter or smaller. I'm gonna get in there and trim all of those out. Uh, I'm gonna open the plant up a little bit for a little bit better airflow. Um, one of the problems with the, like I mentioned, black spot is that sometimes roses get so bushy that the inside portion of the plant doesn't get, uh, isn't allowed to breathe. So we wanna kind of trim that out, open it up a little bit um, and find any dead wood that might be in there. Um, it's gonna be very hard to see here, but. I see on this one, there's like a little dead cane right here. Um, looks like this one already got trimmed off, but um, we would trim out any dead canes, any dead wood, anything like that um, at the start of the year. Um, so that's rose pruning in terms of just trimming the plant back to get the season started. Um, the other thing that I like to do um, in the fall is I like to pile up a little bit of extra mulch around the base of the plant um, that will help uh, insulate the rose canes and the crown of the plant. The crown is that area where the root system uh, meets the trunk or stem, so we call that the crown. Uh, the crown should be just right above grade a little bit, and we want to make sure that that crown doesn't get, you know, really freeze, uh, really freeze dried, or um, sometimes you get some animal damage, things like that. So I like to pile a little bit of extra mulch around the base, nice little mound. So when I'm trimming the rose back in late March mid to mid April, I'm thinning that mulch aside and then I'm trimming back uh, the plant as needed. So, yep. 
But we're going we're gonna to talk now about uh, trimming in season. So one of the things that uh, people are always asking about is what's called deadheading. So you can see this is a spent rose uh, here and we've got the, the stem coming down. And so what I like to do in terms of, of deadheading, you can see this leaf uh, has, this has three leaves right here and this one has five. So hopefully that's uh, visible in the camera there. Um, so when, when I'm deadheading, I like to cut, uh, or even doing any pruning on roses, I like to trim about a quarter inch or so, 45 degree angle. And I like to trim right above uh, a leaflet that has five leaves on it, right? So you can see five leaves, about a quarter inch or so above, the, uh, above this outward facing um, leaf bud and nice little uh, angular cut right there that allows uh, the, the stem will seal itself off better. You're not going to have, if you have a flat end, sometimes you can get, um, you know, water or something sitting on them. Right over here, we have another uh, spent flower. We've got three leaves, three leaves, five leaves right down here. So we're going to go right in there and just cut at an angle. So this is what we're left with. And I'm going to pick this off. The reason that we deadhead is because this right here that's forming, you can kind of see that there, this is called a rose hip. And a rose hip is the rose, rose's seed. Now, when a rose starts producing hips, it's producing or pumping a lot of energy into the production of that seed. That is energy that could be spent on more blossoms. So I like to trim these off. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about self-cleaning roses. Self-cleaning roses are basically roses that really don't produce much of a rose hip and so they will continually bloom. That being said, all roses will rebloom better and faster if you do deadhead. It's not necessary on these uh, repeat blooming or celery. They will rebloom on their own. Old fashioned roses, uh, Florabunda grandifloras, the uh, English roses, things like that, those definitely do wanna be deadheaded. So it's real easy. There's nothing too difficult about it. Um, I like to use a good sharp pair of hand pruners. I've used Felco number twos for uh, my entire career, so 30 plus years. Um, I've been using Felco number twos, they're great, but uh, just any good sharp uh, pair of like bypass or anvil style pruners will work well on these. A little more woody cane, I can get in there and do that. Um, the rest of this plant looks pretty good. It doesn't really need any pruning at the moment. I guess maybe here's one more. Uh, one more spent flower and we can trim that right up there. This is all nice new growth. We've got some buds up here, more buds, a nice healthy flower. So this plant is looking great. We're gonna talk about the variety uh, of this rose here in just a little bit. We'll get the camera put back and clean up here. So that, uh, so we've talked about uh, winter pruning or pruning them back to get the season started and uh, those are really the two main things that people are going to need to do. Of course if you ever have like a broken branch or animal damage or something like that you can get in there and prune that kind of stuff out at any time of year um, and the rose will grow back but in terms of reblooming, it's always going to rebloom better when you do that deadheading. Um, I know it's a, again hard to see, I should have shown it before but uh, the reason that I trim back to the five leaf joint uh, is you'll see this is this is new growth being produced or five leaf joint that's going to become the new stem. So this little thing that's starting right here that's you know about the length of the nail on my pinky pinky finger is going to look just like this in maybe a matter of a week or two tops. So you're going to have this explosion of new growth, new buds, new foliage, all that type of thing. So. That's why we trim back to the five leaf joint versus the three leaf joint. It's more likely to produce that new growth. Um, are there any other questions, Megan, that we've gotten about pruning that I can address before we move on? Any tips for trimming? Okay, so the question was um, about pruning back or pruning a uh, rose uh, for cutting. So if you're gonna be putting, bringing, it, bringing it in the house, putting it in a vase, something like that. Um, couple things. One, you definitely want to go lower on the stem than where I was uh, just pruning so that you have something that you can put in the vase, of course. 
You still want to go uh, whenever possible above a five or even a seven leaf uh, joint. Um, uh, in terms of uh, cutting those though, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter when you do that. Of course, you want to do it when the rose is just getting ready to open, um, not fully open. Uh, we'll probably see here, I'm not sure if I have one that's at that point, but you know that when the, when the bud is starting to, uh, what we would call crack open, so this, this one's getting very close right here. I can actually just, it literally has cracked open. There's a tiny bit of red showing. This is still a very small bud. If you cut them at that stage, you're probably not going to see those buds open. But right when the bud starts cracking open, when the green sheath opens up and you see, can see just a little bit of red, I'll just, uh, um, I don't wanna trim that one off. Maybe we'll do, uh, we'll do this one here. So this would be kind of a nice stage. Uh, I would certainly keep more stem if I was putting that in a vase, obviously. But that would be a nice stage to, uh, to cut that rose, maybe even just a little bit further than that. But that was the best example I had. Um, uh, aside from that, it's, that's really all you need to do. And the nice thing about roses is they're super forgiving. If you cut it too short, too long, uh, that type of thing, it's gonna grow back very quickly. Um, one thing about roses in general, like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, roses love the heat. So roses actually love heat and they prefer a, uh, a drier soil. So that's why roses are just a great summer plant. Um, you see, you know, you think about like Pasadena and the uh, Parade of Roses and Tournament of Roses and all that kind of stuff. Very dry weather out there in Pasadena, California. Um, a lot of the big rose growers, grow their roses in Arizona. Um, it's hot and dry, they love that. In fact, uh, a long while back, I did an experiment with, um, with our staff here in the sales yard. Um, as I mentioned, roses don't like to have the tops watered um, and they don't like to be overly wet. And um, so we, I was talking to the staff about not watering the roses quite as much um, trying to keep them a little on the drier side, that type of thing, because we were starting to see a little bit of black spot in there and they weren't reblooming as fast as they should or producing as much new growth as they should. And um, I believe that was because they were getting a little too much water. So I took a couple of roses that we had in the sales yard and I put them out behind one of the barns where they just sat in the sun and didn't get any water for a week. I put them out there in, in the pot, just like this, put them out there and then after a week, I brought it back in and I showed the, the sales yard team, this is what a rose looks like after a week of no water. And we compared it to the ones that were in the sales yard. The one that uh, hadn't, the, the three roses that had been sitting out, hadn't been watered for a week, were pushing new growth, reblooming, looking really fantastic. No sign of black spot disease where we still did have a little bit of black spot happening on the roses in the sales yard because of overhead watering. So it was a good lesson for them and uh, helped them learn how to care for the roses better. Um, so hopefully that helps you a little bit too. Um, let's jump in and start talking about some of the different varieties of roses that, uh, that I'm partial to and that we sell that are, are good uh, roses for the Northern Illinois area. So again, keep in mind, obviously we're here in Northern Illinois we are a zone five technically, but we for sure have some zone four winters every now and again. So you're, you're going to wanna to find a rose that is more on that four or five uh, range. So there's a lot of roses that, um, that you find on the internet, you find in mail order catalogs, or you see when you're traveling, things like that, maybe at a botanical garden uh, that will not do well here. So you do need to be judicious about the type of rose that you decide to plant in Northern Illinois, but there are some really great varieties, so uh, do not be dismayed. Um, roses prefer full sun, the more sun, the better. I always have people asking me how much shade they can take. Roses can take some shade, it's just they're not going to perform and do what you want them to do uh, in anything less than say six hours of direct sunlight. So if you have say an east foundation where it's getting morning sun, they're just going to do okay. If you have a south facing view where they're getting all that midday hot, intense, direct sunlight, they're going to do extremely well. The south and west side are going to be ideal or, or out in the yard 
away from the home or away from trees where they are going to just bake in the sun all day long, that's going to be the, the ideal location for them. They love that. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about a few varieties that I have used uh, frequently in commercial landscape plantings, where they're out in like parking lot islands or out away from a commercial building where they don't get any care whatsoever and they still perform really well. So the more sun, the better for roses. And as I mentioned, they like it on the drier side. So we wanna make sure that the soil is well drained. Um, if you have a back corner of the yard where water tends to pool when it rains, or you just have a soggy section of the yard, something like that, those would be areas that you would want to avoid roses for sure. Um, they like it on the drier side. The foundation tends to be pretty good for them because usually the foundation is fairly well drained. So up against the house is fine, but out in the yard and just a uh, average soil is perfectly fine too. So um, one other thing before we talk about the different varieties, um, and this is just more of a general statement about roses, in order to produce all of these flowers and continually bloom from end of May until hard frost, which is what most of the roses will do, uh, they need to be fed regularly. Roses are heavy feeders because they're constantly producing all of these flowers. That takes a lot of nutrients. Um, so there's a couple of options for that. Uh, this is rose tone right here. Um, rose tone is an organic rose food. Uh, it can be applied at planting or after planting. It can even be used on potted plants. It is uh, granular, so you just mix it in, uh, either mix it into the, the soil as you're planting or scratch it into the surface uh, right on top of the plant. Um, this works really well. This is great. Um, you can use that about every six or eight weeks. If you have potted roses, um, or if you just uh, are really, you know, if you're doing a lot of cutting and bringing the flowers in and getting them to, wanting them to rebloom a lot, you may want to try something like this. This is Jack's All Purpose. It's a 20-20-20 fertilizer. Uh, it's really great for roses. This can be used about every 10 or 12 days. There's a little scoop in the bucket. It is water soluble. So you just take a scoop, mix it with one gallon of water, and then you can just pour that at the base of the plant. Uh, do that, like I said, about once every 10 to 12 or 14 days or so. So Jack's 202020. Um, there's also a blossom booster fertilizer that um, that Jack's makes. That would work well too. Um, but but for roses specifically, I do like the the triple 20 fertilizer. That's a good one. Um, one other thing is buy some animals. Uh, despite the fact that they have thorns along their stems. Uh, rabbits still like to eat them. Occasionally the deer will munch on them. That's okay, you can take care of that. This is a product called Plant Skid. We sell it in a granular form. So this is the granular form. We also sell it in a liquid, a spray form. The granular can be sprinkled all around the base of the plant. It's very effective against uh, rabbits and moles and voles and mice and all those kind of things. That's the granular version. I find that the deer and rabbits so, you know, the deer being up a little higher might not be deterred by this product being on the ground, but if they're munching the buds off the roses, spraying with plant skid will work really well. Um, it's safe to use, it's organic. Um, it might stain the leaf just a tiny bit. You might notice a little blackish or brownish discoloration. It's totally harmless. Um, it is, the liquid is rainproof. Uh, once it dries, it's rainproof for, uh, for a couple of weeks or months. Um, the other thing that I always like to constantly growing, if you're using the liquid spray, if I spray it right here, and two weeks later the plant is this tall, I'm probably going to need to spray this section too because that section doesn't have any of the uh, plant skid or that, that protection on there. So spray it uh, about once every two or three weeks if you need to, um, and that, that'll work really well. So that's uh, for rabbit and deer protection for the roses. So. Let's jump into some of the different varieties. Um, I want to start off with uh, called um, Easy Elegance. So the Easy Elegance um, is actually kind of a whole series or line of roses that was developed um, up in the Twin Cities, uh, so up in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, so these are, are bred for northern climates. So they're really northern hardy roses. Uh, I really like most of the uh, most of the roses in their line. Um, I've brought three of my favorites here, 
and we'll talk a little bit. About. The first one here is this big, beautiful yellow, uh, yellow rose right here. This is called Yellow Submarine. And the roses uh, come out a nice, bright uh, yellow and then will mature to a pale yellow uh, or kind of a creamy white. Um, it has a nice fragrance to it. The flowers are pretty large. Um, they, they do reproduce pretty readily. So you can see like on this stem right here, we have one flower that's open, but right behind that there's one, two ready to open up. Um, yellow submarine is great in a container. It's great in the ground. It's a more upright style rose. Um, some roses are more upright. Some are more low and spreading. Um, so yellow submarine happens to be an upright, as does this one right here. This is called cashmere. Cashmere is this big, silky red uh, rose. It also has a very nice fragrance to it. It's also upright. The thing working on, what the rose breeder up there was working on, is trying to take the old-fashioned roses, the things that we think about when we think about the roses that our grandparents grew, that type of thing, um, those, those big, fragrant flowers, all of that, and then breed disease resistance and hardiness into those because those were the ones that were more finicky. And um, the rose breeder was pretty successful in that. And so like cashmere is about as close as you can get to that floral quality, buds, good fragrance on a disease resistant winter hardy or northern winter hardy plant. So I really like a lot of the roses in that series, just depends upon what color or style you're looking for. My favorite out of that series for sure is this one right here. This is called Sunrise Sunset, and I wish that you could uh, uh, smell through uh, Facebook Live here because this has a wonderful citrusy kind of fruity fragrance to it. Uh, so Sunrise Sunset has these uh, flower buds that start off kind of a nice peachy pink, so it's kind of a pink on the outside, yellowy-ish uh, on the inside and it opens to a sort of a bicolor flower and then eventually to a fully pink flower over here. Great fragrance, very high bud count. So if you look, this is just a three gallon plant. And if you, you know, if you look at this, I mean, there's five flower buds, five flower buds, five, 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 five more over here. I mean, there's probably 60 or 80 flower buds on this plant right now, just on this one three gallon plant. This is a, a more mounded or uh, you know, slightly spreading style rose. So the first two that I showed you are more upright. This is more mounded or spreading. It'll get about three by three roughly. Um, it blooms like crazy. It is self-cleaning, although it definitely does better with, if it's deadheaded. Um, but great fragrance, really good flower power. So lots and lots of bud count. Uh, and very uh, insect and disease resistant. Um, the, the leaves on this are just a little bit glossier, a little bit thicker, and that tends to make it a little more resistant to, uh, you know, to some of the disease and insect issues that can plague roses. So that's called Sunrise Sunset, and is a, is a really, really great landscape rose. It's one of the few roses that I will use in a commercial landscape setting. So that's the Easy Elegance series. There's a lot of roses in that series. Um, we don't carry all of them, but I do, sorry, I do like a lot of those. Let's get. All right, so the next series of roses that I like for our area um, probably doesn't need much of an introduction. This is the Knockout series. Um, Knockout has been around now for, uh, it's actually, I think, I think last year was, its tw was the uh, 20th anniversary of the introduction of the original Knockout Rose. So, um, so 20 years, I didn't even bring the original up here. Uh, I did bring a couple of others that I wanted to talk about. So the original Knockout Rose was uh, upright, disease resistant, winter hardy, very heavy blooming and a, a bright kind of cherry pink red uh, color to it. And 
It was, uh, it was a hit right off the bat. It was, uh, as described, it was winter hardy and it was disease resistant. Um, they've done a lot of breeding with that rose and have come out with a whole line in the knockout series. So this is, um, this is a really pretty knockout here called Double Pink. So uh, when you hear someone talk about a double rose, that doesn't mean that it tw flowers twice as much. It means that it has twice as many-ish petals. So if you look at these roses here, the, there's a lot of petals on this versus this yellow one over here, which is called Sunny Knockout. You can see it's basically got one layer of petals. So that's a single petaled rose. And this one over here is a double petaled rose. So this is double pink. Kind of zoom in there a little bit. So you can see this has a much fuller, rounder flower. The buds have more of that traditional like rose type uh, look to them, whereas this on Sunny Knockout has more of the flat petaled rose. So Sunny Knockout starts off bright yellow and then fades to kind of a pinkish white. Um, all of the knockout roses are upright in nature. None of them are low or spreading. They're not ground cover roses. Um, but there is a, a, I'll show a couple other ones here. So we've got double pink and sunny in the front. And this is uh, a little, this one's a little bit newer. I believe it came out maybe three years ago. This is coral knockout. Um, I've been really impressed with coral. High bud count, really nice, that traditional like coral pink color which is neat it also has a little more fragrance i've noticed than some of the other knockouts they all have a nice fragrance to them but they're not very strong but uh, the coral knockout has a nice uh pretty strong fragrance to it and then this is a brand new introduction from uh from the knockout line uh this just came out uh this season this is called Petite Every Way. So the, the leaves are actually a little bit smaller. The distance between leaf buds is much smaller. So that's what makes it a very dwarf plant. So you can see it's a much denser, fuller plant than some of the other roses that we were looking at. But you can also see it, it's still a double flower, but it's a tiny little flower. So this is only gonna get about 18 inches tall. Um, not a real strong fragrance, but it is a very heavy bloomer. Uh, nice dark green foliage with really good scarlet flowers. So great little plant. This one, like I said, just came out. Um, so really, uh, I mean, it's been, a, it's been a nice performing plant for us so far in the garden center. Um, but like I said, it just came out, so we don't have a lot of uh, history with it. But if it's anything like the rest of the Knockout series, I think it's gonna be a good, uh, a good plant. So the Knockout series is bred by uh, Star Roses. And uh, they've, they've done a really good, uh, they've done a really good job. They also, uh, oh, thanks. That's what I was looking for. So Star Roses is also the breeder of uh, the Drift family of roses. So I really like the Drift series. Drift is a ground cover series. So the knockout series are going to be that upright, you know, more tall uh, and elegant traditional rose. This is more of your hedge or ground cover rose. Um, so this is this is red drift. We there's a whole line of drift roses. There's red drift, sweet drift, sweet drift. So there's a, a whole bunch of them, um, all different colors, of course, but they're all relatively, excuse me, relatively similar in that they're they're spreading roses. They will get around 24 inches tall. They'll get about three feet wide. They have uh, small, very heavy blooming uh, flower clusters. So when they're in full bloom, there's almost more flower than there is foliage. Um, they have a nice glossy foliage, which uh, helps prevent disease. I'm with my friend Bob yesterday, who was in here purchasing a couple of uh, Scarlet Drift Roses and the Drift series has a very nice glossy foliage. That glossy foliage, if we look here compared to some of the other roses, that glossy foliage helps prevent disease and insect damage. Uh, some of the more like, uh, you know, I, I don't know that there's really a name for it, but sort of the matte finish ro uh, leaves are going to be a little more disease prone. That glossy nature helps protect the leaf surface uh, from disease and insects. So, Glossy leaves, really pretty flowers. 
Uh, peach Drift starts off a nice uh, almost amber or peachy color and then opens to a nice pink flower. Um, there's a Popcorn Drift, which is white and buttery yellow, which is kind of neat. That's a really popular one. So that's the Drift series. If you're looking for a hedge or a big border plant, something like that, this is a really good one for that. So this is, this is a rose here called At Last. And At Last is probably uh, the most fragrant of the shrub type roses. Uh, At Last is a nice uh, peachy orange color. It has a wonderful uh, fragrance to it. It's a heavy re-bloomer. Um, this was introduced uh, several years ago from uh, Proven Winners. And uh, the name At Last refers to the fact that they have at last, they have finally developed a rose that has the, the fragrance of the old fashioned roses, but in a uh, shrub rose, which the shrub roses are known for their disease resistance and winter hardiness and all of that kind of thing. Uh, but the old fashioned roses had that fragrance and this has a very strong fragrance. It is, um, it actually is, is remarkably fragrant. Uh, so that's, that's a really nice one. Proven Winners has also uh, released a series um, of shrub roses. I would say um, to the Drift series, um, this is the Oso oh Easy series. Um, so this is uh, Oso oh Easy Double Pink. This is Oso oh Easy Double Red. Um, you've got the, the double petaled flowers. You've got the smaller clustered flowers versus the more traditional upright rose. Uh, heavy re-bloomers. Um, they are considered self-cleaning roses, so when you have a big hedge of these, you do not have to worry about deadheading them at all. If you enjoy deadheading and trimming and getting out, it is not necessary. So they bloom continuously until hard frost. So, you know, they're obviously they're blooming now and they are going to bloom until middle of October uh, for sure. I've actually had um, knockout roses blooming, um, still in bloom on Thanksgiving before. So it, they're pretty remarkable plants. Once they get themselves going and established, they, they will give you a ton of color. I brought a couple of roses over here that um, are just kind of uh, fun, unique plants. This is a, uh, an heirloom rose, uh, one that's been around a long time called Zephyrin Druin. And it has this nice bubblegum pink flower, uh, light fragrance, not real strong. But one of the things that's interesting about Zephyrin Druin is it's basically thornless. There's, there's no thorns on here. Occasionally you will find all the way down at the bottom or underneath the stem, you may find one little tiny, basically a thornless rose, blooms really well. Uh, surprisingly is relatively shade tolerant. I've actually uh, had really good luck with Zephyrin Druin blooming east side, blooming under a tree where it's you know getting dappled light, that type of thing. So a little more um, versatile than some other roses. It's a kind of a climber. It's for sure an upright rose, um, but it will climb a bit. Uh, it would love a little support of some kind, a trellis, an obelisk, um, something like that would be really nice for it. So. That's a neat one um, called Zephyrin Druin. And uh, this one here, unfortunately, was a little closer to the sprinklers and stuff, so it's got a little bit of black spot in it. But this is a really nice climber. We get a lot of requests for climbing roses. This one here is called New Dawn. Uh, it's an excellent climber. The uh, flower buds are kind of a, uh, a very pale silvery pink color and then open to a very pale pink, almost white flower. Um, nice fragrance, hardy, quick grower. Um, this is one of those you can put it in and just let it go. Again, definitely needs a support of some kind, a trellis, uh, an obelisk style rose uh, trellis of some kind. Any of those are going to work. And then I wanted to mention the David Austin roses. Unfortunately, we're actually in between crops on these. And I think this is that there's maybe one or two 
David Austin Rose's left uh, right now, but we should be uh, getting some more uh, available to us this week. Uh, this one here is called uh, Benjamin Britton. And uh, David Austin Roses are uh, a whole line of English roses. Um, they are bred for big, bred for their fragrance. They are a little more finicky in terms of needing a little bit of care. You know, some of the spraying that I mentioned early, uh, for sure fertilization, that type of thing, but definitely are gonna enjoy being sprayed a bit. Um, this, is a, this is a climber. Most of them are more upright and more climbing in nature. A few of them are bushy. Um, this one, is a, uh, it starts off a really bright red and opens to a uh, kind of a reddish pink. Very, very fragrant. Um, there's a bright purple one called Munstead Wood. There's white ones like Winchester Cathedral. But the David Austin series is, uh, I mean, they're, the, if you look at their catalog or you go online to davidaustin.com and look at them, you are going to see some of the most beautiful roses you've ever seen. Unfortunately, more than half of them, or maybe more than three quarters of them, are not suited for Northern Illinois. So you do have to be a little more careful. Um, these definitely would prefer some winter protection. Um, I don't like rose cones. That's a kind of an old fashioned thing. You know, you used to see people with those styrofoam cones with a brick on top of it, covering the rose. Not a fan of those at all. First of all, they look hideous. Um, but secondly, and more importantly, on a hot uh, or a, a sunny, uh, winter day, it gets too warm in there. It can start to produce new growth. Um, there's no air circulation inside there, so there's just a lot of uh, things wrong with it. So if I have a rose that needs protection, um, just like I mentioned last week on my hydrangea talk, I like to take a, uh, like a wire cage. It could be something like a tomato cage. It can be a um, chicken wire, something like that to wrap it. Um, if you did a tomato cage, you could put burlap around it then after the tomato cage is in. If you use chicken wire, just put the chicken wire and then fill the inside of the cage, re regardless of what style cage, with leaves. That's a really great winter protection uh, for them. Um, I also like to put a little bit of mulch around the base of the plant. Again, the crown, just to protect that for the winter. So a little extra mulch around the base, some leaves uh, of any kind, just kind of insulating the whole thing. Uh, and then take that off in late March. So that's a really good way to protect your roses without those ugly rose cones. Um, and again, it's a, a better, better for the plant anyway. So that's David Austin roses. Yeah, just a couple more here. So the flower carpet series, um, Flower Carpet Series uh, is probably the shortest, uh, hardiest uh, rows out there. This particular one right here, which is just getting ready to bloom, I don't even think there's any open blooms on it. This is called uh, Flower Carpet Pink Supreme. It, is a, it has that glossy foliage that I was talking about before, so that makes the Flower Carpet Series really disease resistant. Um, more resistant to insect and other pests and more resistant to black spot and things like that. It is a very heavy blooming rose. Um, pink Supreme is the second generation. They first came out with flower carpet pink. Um, and after uh, many years of breeding, they came out with uh, Pink Supreme, which is just a heavier blooming uh, variety than the original. Um, really, really nice rose, mildly fragrant, uh, huge flower power though. I know, again, it's hard to see on a, on a video here, but there are, uh, I mean, dozens and dozens of flower buds just ready to pop. So this is going to be gorgeous in about five or six days uh, with the heat that we're getting. It's gonna be beautiful in just a couple of days. So that's Pink Supreme, as the name suggests, flower carpet. It is a low spreading rose, uh, 36 inches wide, 18, maybe 24 inches tall. Um, very low maintenance. If you're looking for something that you can just kind of put in and forget, the flower carpet series uh, would be great for you. This is uh, flower carpet amber. So flower carpet amber, the buds start off a nice orangey uh, peach color and then open to a nice amber yellow type color. Um, mild friend, definitely the, the most heavy blooming of the flower carpet series 
is going to be the pink supreme. Uh, scarlet carpet is fantastic. Um, the uh, amber carpet is really nice. So that's the flower carpet series. And uh, then we have one, one last uh, rose here because I, I wanted to save this one. Uh, this is a, a new series that came out of uh, Monrovia growers off the uh, west coast. I guess they're actually on both, both coasts now. Uh, Monrovia put out this plant. This is called uh, Grace and Grit Red. Um, so this is, has the hardiness and reliability of a shrub rose, but has the uh, long stem traditional uh, red, you know, Valentine's Day type rose look to it. So you've got the big double red flowers, nice long stems, upright in nature, but hardy and disease resistant like the shrub roses. So that's grace and grit red. It is a true red. There's no pink to it. It's a nice uh, scarlet red. It's upright, uh, gets about three to four feet tall, um, blooms until frost. So that's, excuse me, that's a really nice one if you're looking for that traditional, uh, you know, Valentine's Day type rose look. Uh, there are dozens of other colors and um, varieties that we have. Those are some of my favorites uh, just in terms of the series. So the Drift series, the Knockout series, the Flower Carpet series, the Easy Elegance, uh, David Austin. Those are some of the ones that I like a lot. Um, but in those series, there are many other colors. So we have lots of options. If you want more muted colors, there's some whites and yellows and things like that. If you want the, you know, the bright colors, you've got you know, some of the, uh, the Pink Supreme and some of those are, are going to be very bright. Uh, they're all uh, pretty disease resistant, but again, with our humid summers here, you're going to have to be on the lookout for powdery mildew and black spot disease. And then in terms of insects, you're just going to want to watch for um, potentially aphids and um, potentially Japanese beetles. And uh, lastly, um, one thing that we're seeing a bit of right now that is affecting some roses is an insect called rose sawfly. So if you're seeing little um, like white spots all over the leaves or it looks like, uh, or if the leaves of your roses are starting to look like lace or Swiss cheese or something, right now at this time of year, usually starting at Mother's Day and uh, then proceeding into the summertime, you might have rose sawfly. Um, so rose sawfly, if you had treated earlier with this systemic drench, that would uh, be effective. The downside to drenches is that uh, it can take several weeks for the plant to take this up. So it's going to be unprotected. If we applied this today, it's gonna to be unprotected for another two to three weeks probably. So it's not gonna be super effective right away. So if you're having a problem today with like rose sawfly or something like that, um, there's three different rose sawflies. They're all in our area. They all could be affecting your roses. This is a really good systemic insecticide. So systemic means it gets absorbed into the plant. Um, this, is a, uh, a, this is not a neonicotinoid. So if, uh, if you look online or if you read any of the reports, a lot of people are trying to avoid the use of um, chemicals that are called neonics or neonicotinoids um, because there's some evidence, although there's a little bit of evidence on both sides, but there's some evidence that says that the neonics are causing uh, damage to our honeybee population. This, uh, and this is not a neonicotinoid. Uh, so this is an alternative chemistry to the neonics. So this is very effective, um, gets absorbed into the plant, works from you know, both contact kill, as well as works from the inside out as the insects are feeding on the plant. If you do not spray for uh, rose sawfly, depending upon which type you have, because I, as I mentioned, there's three different types, some of them uh, will multiply and have uh, four to six generations per year, so they'll be feeding all season long. Some of them just feed initially early in the spring and then stop and, and then go away. If you're fortunate to have that one, the rose will just grow right out of it. But if you have some of the other ones that have multiple generations, then you uh, for sure are gonna need to spray, otherwise your plants will be defoliated in pretty short order. So uh, systemic insect control, this just gets mixed with water uh, in a pump sprayer or a spray bottle of some kind and then sprayed on the foliage. 
if you're doing any spraying, I always like to spray very early in the morning. Uh, a lot of these um, uh, products are oil-based, and when you have oil on the leaf surface and it's hot and the sun is out, uh, it, it can make it very difficult for that uh, leaf to breathe properly, and so you can have uh, foliage burn as a result of applying some of these types of products in the heat of the day when it's over 80 degrees and it's sunny. So early morning is best. It'll dry. It'll work really well. Um, so if you're having some problems, this would be a really good product for you to use right now. So um, that's all I had for roses. Um, we, we talked about a lot. I hope you, um, even though we talked about some of the issues that you can have with roses, I hope that that doesn't scare you off from planting roses because the fragrance and the flower power, power and the color are really worth the extra effort and, and it's not a guarantee that you're going to have those issues. It's just occasionally we do depending upon the location and the season and the weather and all of those kind of things. So um, they are great for that season long color. You know, people come in here all the time and they ask for something that's going to bloom all season long. And generally the answer is, aside from roses there's uh, and, and annual tropical plants, there is nothing that is going to bloom from spring until fall. All of the perennial plants, as beautiful as they are, have a bloom season. They're going to bloom for four weeks or six weeks in the spring, in the early summer, in the late summer, whatever the case may be. But roses will bloom continuously from late May all the way until uh, October. So if you're looking for a lot of color, that's a really great way to do it. If you're looking for something easy for a container, that's a really good way to get some color too uh, on the porch or patio. So I hope that helps. Um, if there's uh, any questions, as always, shoot them in the comments. I know Megan has been uh, furiously typing over there, so I know that she's answering a lot of your questions. Uh, so please feel free to uh, hit, hit us in the comment section, or of course, come in, uh, ask us questions. Um, doesn't just have to be roses, but I have people on a regular basis bringing in Ziploc bags with samples from their plants at home. Hey, Matt, what's going on with this plant, with that plant? I'm always happy to do that. Uh, we've got a great staff here that'll help you find the right product to, uh, to help with your particular situation. Um, so I hope that helps and I hope that you get outside this weekend and enjoy the wonderful weather. Until next time, thanks for watching.